As Lyndon Johnson once said, he who controls the weather controls the world. Many people in the U.S. firmly believe that gas emitted by jets and other planes are mixed with toxins or other chemicals through chemtrails. Sometimes you look into the sky and you see a bunch of them. But what exactly is the result of all these man-made clouds and have they been downplaying the consequences? From different ways to make it rain to classified projects, here are things you didn't know about weather control. Number 11. Metals in our skies Aviation experts are likely to tell you that that's just what happens when fuel gets released that high up in the atmosphere. But do people actually have a reason to be concerned with this? It's been proven that Army scientists were releasing top secret compounds such as cadmium sulfide over the skies of St. Louis. Others believe that the experiments haven't stopped and they're trying to create or already have different chemicals that can provoke weather changes, while some seem to think that chemicals still play a role in dumbing down the public. In any case, different types of fuel release from jets high up in our atmosphere emits metals like aluminum, calcium, and other heavy metals that can change the weather and the air we breathe. Number 10. Hail Cannons One of the very first methods used to control the weather after the rain dance was the hail cannon. Farmers way back in the 1900s would try to fight off upcoming storms with these hail cannons by firing rockets or cannonballs at them. Their attempt was to essentially disrupt the atmosphere somehow in order to keep hail from ruining their crops. This of course didn't work too well at first, then some modern experiments involving chemicals like acetylene and oxygen were attempted. They believed that the shock wave from the sound and or chemicals would be enough to turn the hail into slush or just rain. There seems to be some indication that these are actually still used too. Number 9. Cloud Seeding Cloud seeding involves the process of flying in a plane and releasing particulate matter into the sky, kind of like chemtrails. This will eventually build moisture in the sky, causing it to rain. In the province of Victoria and Australia, making it rain at the club is perfectly legal, but making it actually rain is a whole other story. Trying to take the weather into your own hands can be a risky business, and under the Rain Making Control Act of 1967, this makes it illegal. People have tried various ways to make it rain throughout history, but some of the scientific ways include cloud seeding. We looked into it a little bit and they did an experiment which involved silver iodine, frozen carbon dioxide, and other harmful substances. But actually, there appears to be an effective method of cloud seeding that's been discovered, and they're using it in the Sierra Mountains. But don't try any of that stuff in Australia or you might get locked up. Number 8. Operation Popeye a highly classified operation known as Operation Popeye took place, where the U.S. government was dedicated to bringing a huge monsoon to the capital city of Vietnam, which would hopefully cause a flood or a landslide to the area. The U.S. experimented with different chemicals such as silver iodine and lead iodine over states such as Florida and Texas in order to bring upon a hurricane, but they also did this over territories such as Guam, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Okinawa. This took place back in 1967 to 1962, which would hopefully flood some enemy territory. It didn't work out as a weapon right away, but the technology was still rather new at the time. In modern times, cloud seeding is still put to use, but for other reasons. Number 7. Project Storm Fury One comment was made by the leader of the free world that would suggest nuking a hurricane in order to stop it. Maybe that person was making fun of weather control projects the US has committed in the past. Possibly. Project Storm Fury was apparently an experiment to help prevent damage caused by hurricanes and tropical storms. This was all brought possible by joint research from General Electric and the U.S. military. General Electric was interested in cloud seeding for a while until they caused a major snowstorm. Due to legal concerns, they passed over the project to the U.S. military. This project would eventually eat up a lot of funding for the Hurricane Research Division, which has a budget of about $2.6 million a year. Bomber aircraft was used to fire silver iodine and dry ice, which actually caused a hurricane to change directions. Fidel Castro, the dictator of Cuba, claimed that the U.S. was trying to weaponize hurricanes, but who knows if he was right or not. Number 6. Project 112 The government has obviously been concerned with the best possible ways to spray toxic chemicals since the time of the Cold War. And you have to wonder if some of the spraying tech research that was used for Project 112 made it into chemtrails somehow. The experiment was mainly concerned with the use of aerosol spray to spray chemicals and biological weapons. Some of these tests included spraying biological and neurological agents throughout the air conducted on land and sea, including places like the US, Great Britain, and Canada. It also seems as though the dispersion method worked a little bit too well and some civilians were exposed in Hawaii, Florida, and Alaska. A sub-project known as SHAD tested how naval ships would be affected by a biological warfare attack, which eventually led to serious health complications of those who were involved. 
Eventually, a press conference was given at the Pentagon by William Weekenwerder, and he disclosed some of the bizarre details of this project. Number 5. HARP The acronym HARP stands for High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program and was an ionospheric research program funded by the U.S. Air Force. However, the U.S. Navy and University of Alaska as well as DARPA and Built by Bay all got together in Kokona, Alaska to make this thing. Bay is basically the British version of DARPA, so you can tell this is a pretty massive project. Each tower can generate 10,000 watts of electricity and there's 360 of them all linked together. This fires one massive electric beam into the ionosphere, which is the uppermost part of our atmosphere. This will then send a radio wave back to Earth. It can seemingly microwave the ionosphere, and if any temperature changes happen here, it results in massive storms. The government claims to be using it for communication with deeply submerged submarines and to locate underground enemy bases. Other people believe that a harp can be used to control the weather and create catastrophic earthquakes, hurricanes, and volcanic eruptions. Although it might seem a little bit far-fetched, in 2014, at a congressional hearing, a U.S. Air Force official did say that a harp was used to control the ionosphere. The site in Alaska is apparently closed down, the technology is used all over the globe on naval ships or other large vessels, and could be very well getting more and more advanced each and every day. Economic Weather Control So after hearing about some experiments involving the control of the weather, you might have to wonder, why would they want to do this? Not only can the weather be used as a weapon of war, being able to control the weather can make some people some serious money. For example, let's just say you're a CEO of a mega food corporation in America. You have an unlimited source of money, but you have some pesky competition from other countries who are supplying their own people with food that they grow. Wouldn't it be so sad if a big drought happened there and those people were forced to buy your food instead? You'd be crying your way all the way to the bank with some crocodile tears. So much of our economy is relying on weather that being able to predict the weather could earn you some big money on the stock market. What about a city that's relying on having warm weather to bring in tourists? There's no money to be made if people aren't flocking to the beaches and it's rain all the time. What if you own a ski lodge and it's not snowing anymore? You'll be out of business. What if you're a gas company and it's too warm for people to be using your gas? Time to make it cold again? Those are just a few examples, so we're sure you can think of a few on your own. Number 3. Space Mirrors Okay, so we got chemtrails, electromagnetic waves, hail cannons, and what else? Oh yeah, don't forget about the space mirrors. It's unclear this project is actually going on right now, but sending giant mirrors into space to reflect some sunlight has been proposed by climate change scientists. The idea was presented by Lala Wood. It almost seems like some kind of project that an evil villain in a comic book would come up with. A cheaper proposal was eventually considered which would utilize highly reflective balloons and sulfur dioxide which was released by volcanoes. Do you remember when Mount Tambora went off and caused a year without a summer? This happened because of sulfur dioxide went into the atmosphere and it can have a cooling effect. Number 2. Geoengineering Consequences Organizations concerned with geoengineering are warning that if we don't stop this soon, the repercussions could be catastrophic. While there might be a few benefits such as a beautiful red and yellow sunset and an increase in plant productivity, the cons are quite obvious. They warn that it'll increase the chance of gaining a sunburn, whiter skies, drought in Asia and Africa, reduction in solar power, ocean acidification, and ozone depletion. All these consequences were published by the AMS, or American Meteorological Society, on their website, and we're not just making this all up. Can you imagine living somewhere where the skies just don't seem blue anymore? And number 1. Terraforming Mars So let's take a look at how weather control might be able to make Mars great again. Mars has an abundance of water that's just waiting to be melted. But in order for it to melt, we need to change the conditions on Mars to make it just a little bit warmer. There's been a few proposals to do this. For one, we need to get more greenhouse gases over there such as methane, carbon dioxide, etc. Ammonia is another powerful gas that should be considered as useful in changing Mars' climate. There's quite a bit of it in our solar system that could be transported there. Some scientists are still rather firm to believe that Mars is located within the habitable zone of our solar system and needs an atmosphere like ours in order for it to transform into an Earth-like planet. Making Mars warm enough to create plants should be able to give us oxygen in exchange. This should be the ultimate thing for humans to do that will make us an interplanetary species. 